Well, Ryan was right that uh, if you're sitting in the back, you may have a little hard time seeing tonight. We're uh, continuing kind of our topical study through the great doctrines of the Bible, and we're using our statement of faith kind of as a guide through those great doctrines. And we come tonight to section six, which is the doctrine of salvation. And so what a wonderful theme we have to talk about tonight. And I'm going to try in the space of the 45 minutes that we have together to just kind of give you an overview of the biblical teaching on salvation. This is something that usually if you're going to kind of teach a topical course on is something that would usually take multiple sessions. And so tonight is a little bit going to be uh, kind of like skipping a rock across a pond. We're just going to kind of hit uh, some of the key points and we're not going to be able to go too deep into any one of them, but I just want to kind of try to give you an overview to try to at least whet your appetite for further study. So let's uh, begin just by kind of going through, <clears throat> pardon me, the great summary uh, that we have in our doctrinal statement of this doctrine. The salvation of sinful people is the work of God and is totally of grace. Salvation is the gift of God, which is received through repentance from sin and personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, based on the finished work of Christ in bearing the guilt and penalty of our sin. The moment a person believes in Christ as Savior, that person passes from death to eternal life and is justified before God in the righteousness of Christ. The true believer is assured of God's acceptance and love forever because of Christ's work and not because of the believer's efforts. Jesus Christ is the only Savior, and apart from him there is no salvation. Those who do not receive God's free gift of eternal life will perish under the wrath of a holy God. It's a great summary of the biblical teaching on the doctrine of salvation. And what I want to do tonight is just try to go through some of really the essential aspects of our understanding of salvation as revealed in Scripture, and then go through some of the key terms uh, that Scripture uses to describe what God has done for us. So let's start with just kind of going through, this is not a comprehensive list, but this is just some of the ones that I selected that I thought were important just to bring to your mind. The first, and this is a, a really key doctrine, a key component of the doctrine of salvation, is substitutionary atonement substitutionary atonement. Here's what this means. It means that Christ took the place of the sinner and bore the penalty of God's divine wrath towards sin. The sinner's sins are imputed to Christ, and Christ's righteousness is imputed to the sinner. And this is, therefore, the objective and judicial basis for our justification for forgiveness. So substitutionary atonement very simply means that Christ took our place. He died in our place. He took the wrath that we deserved upon himself. And the Scripture set, talks about this all over the place. I mean, there's so many passages that we could go to, but we'll just uh, go to just a few of them uh, just to kind of give you an idea of what Scripture teaches. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. This is a, a wonderful and, and very brief statement of this doctrine, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Right? Do you see the trading of places there? God made him, that is Christ, who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him, right? He dies in our place to pay for our sin, and then we get to have his righteousness given to us. Look at 1 Peter 2, 24, where the doctrine of substitution is taught very clearly as well. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. 1 Peter 2, 24 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, for by his wounds you were healed. Right? Took our place, bore our sins in his body on the tree. <clears throat> this is not just taught in the New Testament, it's taught in the Old Testament. Look at Isaiah 53, the great prophetic description 
of the suffering of the Messiah. Isaiah chapter 53, beginning with verse 4. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. And then skip down to verse 10. It says, The Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief if he would render himself as a guilt offering. Verse 12. It says, Because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. There are many other passages which teach this great doctrine. This is the basis of our salvation, that great substitution of Christ taking our place, dying in our stead on our behalf. Now, this substitution was foreshadowed in the Old Testament. The Lord gave many examples in the Old Testament to help us understand what Messiah was going to do. So, for example, if we go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve fall into sin, and they're under the judgment of death, and they're hiding from the Lord, and they're sowing fig leaves to try to cover their shame, what does the Lord do? It says that He clothed them in the skin of an animal. In other words, there was an animal who was put to death as a sacrifice in order to cover their shame and their sin. So you have actually the first animal sacrifice all the way back in Genesis chapter 3 where the animal dies in the place of Adam and Eve. Then we have, for example, the story of Abraham and Isaac. And remember when the Lord asked Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac, and then at the very last moment, the Lord stays Abraham's hand and it says in Genesis chapter 22, verse 13, that God provided a lamb, and it says, in the place of his son. The lamb dies in the place of Isaac, that substitutionary atonement. Then you go to the nation of Israel and slavery, and you have the Passover lamb, where to release the, the nation from Egypt, the destroying angel is going to come and destroy all of the firstborn, but God gives the nation of Israel instructions that they are to sacrifice a lamb and to take the blood and put it on the doorpost of their houses. And when the destroying angel would come by, he would pass over every house that had the marking of the blood of the lamb. And so all of the firstborn of Israel sitting inside their houses would have the destroying angel pass by because a lamb had died in their place. They were passed over in judgment because of the blood of the Lamb. Then in the Mosaic uh, times and the times of, of the theocratic kingdom of Israel, in the sacrificial system, you had the Day of Atonement. And you had also many other sacrifices, all of which involved animals being sacrificed in the place of the sinner. People would come and offer a lamb in place of their sin. So the whole Old Testament and the teaching of the prophets and then all of the New Testament and the teaching of the apostles all teach this idea of substitutionary atonement, that Jesus Christ suffered and died in the place of the sinner to take and bear the penalty of sin, the wrath of God for sin upon himself. As I quoted this morning, it's a great quote to, to repeat by Dr. MacArthur. It's a, he says, God treated Jesus as you deserved so that you could be treated as he deserved, right? There's that great substitution. Second really key component of our doctrine of salvation is salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, right? This is a salvation which is not obtained by human works or merit. It is obtained by God's grace and only by God's grace and by faith alone, not by faith plus works. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, but here's an important follow-on thought. 
But the faith that saves never remains alone, right? The great reformers taught that we were saved by faith alone, but the faith which saves us doesn't remain alone. Rather, because faith leads to the new birth, a new life, the born-again person begins to follow the Lord, begins to produce the fruit of repentance. And so works, good works, according to Scripture, are the result of justification, the result of salvation, but they are not the cause. And so often in the world, there are false religions and false teachers who try to switch those between themselves. They try to make works the cause of salvation rather than the result. But that is very illogical, right? As we've been studying in the mornings, the Scripture teaches that the unbeliever is dead in sin. He cannot do good works because he is spiritually dead. He must first be given new life, and then his new life can be manifested in works of righteousness and of good works. The great expression of this doctrine is in Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. So, to do a little math here, kind of to put it in a little equation form, and this is adapted from John Gerstner's uh, section in a book called Justification by Faith Alone, He talks about that the saving truth is this. Faith produces, right? Faith equals justification, and then works are a result of that, right? So faith equals justification plus works. The heretical view, which is often taught by false teachers and false religions, reverses that order. uh, a, A heretical view would say that faith plus works results in justification. But again, notice how works is put as the cause of justification rather than as it should be the result, right? Works results or flows from justification. It is not the cause of justification. There's one other error that sometimes is taught, and that is a error that says that faith results in justification and a justification which is devoid of works. In other words, there's this idea that you can be saved and have no life change. You just kind of one day, you say something or you do something, you get saved, and the rest of your life you can live like an absolute pagan. There can be absolutely zero fruit of repentance, no evidence at all of new life, nothing that flows from from this experience of being born again and yet be saved. That's an error, right? As Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 teaches, we're saved by grace through faith. It is not by works, but verse 10 says, we are his workmanship, right? When Christ makes us alive, gives us new life, when we are born again, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus, right? We're a new creation in Christ Jesus, and we're created for what? For good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them, that we would have a different way of living. So the correct biblical doctrine is that faith, and we're saved by faith alone, and faith means that we are justified by the righteousness of Christ, and then we are indwelled by the Holy Spirit who begins to produce good works in us, who begins the process of sanctification. So as we look at kind of this uh, you know, these equations, we can kind of identify some of the errors that are out there. For example, there are those who teach that salvation comes by sacramental rituals, right? This would be the Roman Catholic Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church. You are saved by rituals plus faith, right? Or sacraments plus faith. And again, that is putting works as a cause of justification, which is an unbiblical error. There are those who teach salvation by faith plus religious service. So, for example, the Jehovah Witnesses and the Mormons teach that you have to go out and kind of do your mission and do your witnessing and all those things, and it is those good works which are a key part in their view of salvation. You have to do them in order to be saved. 
which is an error. It is salvation by works. Then you have the liberal churches who teach a very amorphous idea, but it is the idea of salvation by moral goodness. In fact, if I was going to put the liberal equation up there, it would be works with no faith, just salvation purely by works. You can deny all of the essential doctrines. You cannot believe the Bible, but if you're a good person, then you'll go to heaven. That's liberalism and an error. And then you have some of the denominations out there that teach baptismal regeneration. They turn baptism into a work which produces salvation rather than it being the fruit or the result or the evidence of justification. So there are errors that are out there, and we need to be very clear in our own presentations of the gospel that we are saved by faith alone, and, that, and when we are saved, the Lord begins to work in us to produce the fruit of repentance, to produce that fruit of a new life. And Jesus said, you'll know a tree by its fruit, right? He said, no good tree can produce bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. So going back to our, our key doctrines, we see now the next one is the imputation of Christ's righteousness, the imputation of Christ's righteousness. Now, a lot of times, I think this is a, a fairly neglected doctrine in a lot of churches, right? Everybody talks a lot about Jesus dying in our place. They talk about the fact that He paid for our sins. But what a lot of people don't understand is that, is that you can't get to heaven just by having an absence of guilt. You need to have the presence of righteousness. And so, the Scripture teaches the imputation of Christ's righteousness to us. We could define it this way. The righteousness by which we are justified is Christ's perfect life of righteousness, which is credited to us through faith. It is Christ's righteousness, not ours, that saves us. And this righteousness is imputed or credited to us. Our faith is not our righteousness. Rather, it is the means by which we receive Christ's righteousness. His righteousness, right? He is the only one ever who was born and lived and died in perfect obedience to God the Father, who perfectly kept all of the demands of the law, who was perfectly holy without sin and undefiled. He did what we would have had to do in order to be saved. He lived a righteous life. And so he, and he alone, has righteousness sufficient to save. No other human being, no other being has that. Not saints, not clergy, no one. It is his righteousness and his righteousness alone which can save. Look at Philippians chapter 3 verse 9. Philippians 3, 9. <clears throat> Paul is speaking of all that he has counted as loss for the, first, for the surpassing value of knowing Christ. And he says that he wants to gain Christ. In verse 9 he says, And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Right? We need a righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. We need righteousness credited or imputed to us by faith. Look at Romans chapter 3, verse 22. And there are many others, but for sake of time, we'll do just this one. Romans 3, 22. This is in the passage where Paul has been talking about the incredible sinfulness of man. And in Romans 3.22, actually we'll start in, in 3.21, it says, Now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. 
right? So look at verse 22 again. You have the righteousness of God, a righteousness which belongs to God, which comes from God, and is given by faith or through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. His righteousness credited or imputed to us. And notice that faith is described in these verses as the means of receiving justification, not the basis. Faith is the means we receive this righteousness. It is not the righteousness itself. And so our faith must be in Christ, not in our faith. You don't have faith in your faith. You have faith in Christ. And a lot of people struggle with doubt because they're constantly trying to figure out how good their faith is, how strong their faith is, whether it's enough faith, whether it's the right kind of faith and all of these types of things. And they are having a trouble with doubt because they are trying to place their faith in their faith. They forget that the object of faith is Christ, and faith is merely the means. Maybe to illustrate it this way, if we were to describe righteousness as water, right? Let's, you know, living water that comes from God, that's his righteousness. Faith is the tube through which it would come to us. It is not the water itself, right? Faith is the means through which the righteousness is credited to us, but the righteousness itself comes from God. It is the righteousness of Christ, and therefore, the solution to a weak faith is to look to Christ. Right? As the people in the Gospels said, they came to Jesus and said, we believe, help our unbelief. Right? In other words, they realized that their faith itself was weak, but they cast the object of their faith on Christ. They looked to Him. They looked to Him and His righteousness for salvation, not even to their own faith. We are saved by grace through faith. And then the fourth one, the exclusivity of the gospel. This is another key tenet of a biblical doctrine of salvation. Here's the description of this doctrine. Salvation is by hearing with faith. It's described in Galatians that way. Salvation comes by hearing with faith. No one will be saved who has not personally received Christ as Lord and Savior. Faith must have an object, and that object must be Christ. And the content of that faith must be the gospel. Now, there are a lot of passages that we could go to to talk about this. One of the greatest passages is Romans chapter 1 through 3, where Paul systematically goes through and discusses all of those theoreticals, right? What about the person who only has general revelation? What about the person who only has their conscience? And he discusses the fact that because creation is known to all, He says that all people are without excuse because everyone has the law of God written on their heart and their conscience. They are all without excuse. So let's ask the question, is Jesus the only way of salvation? Can someone be saved apart from faith in Him? I think maybe instead of going to the more theological sections, I would take you to Matthew chapter 26, verse 39. Let's join the Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane for a minute. Matthew chapter 26, verses 39 through 42. Jesus goes a little beyond the disciples and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, So you men could not keep watch with me for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again a second time and prayed, saying, My father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, your will be done. What is he talking about? Very clearly from parallel passages, we understand that he is talking about drinking the cup of the wrath of God towards sin. He's saying, look, if it's possible, if there was some other way, let this cup pass by me, right? If, if these people, these sinners, can be saved without me drinking the cup of wrath, without the agony of the cross, without bearing the wrath of God, let it pass from me. Not my will, but yours be done. And clearly, 
It was the only way. Christ's suffering was not in vain, not for nothing. Look at Galatians chapter 2, verse 21. Galatians chapter 2, verse 21. Paul says very clearly, I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. Right? So in other words, if there was a way where people could be saved just merely by keeping God's law, if they could be righteous that way, then Christ died needlessly. This is why Jesus himself said in John 14, 6, right? What did he say? He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one, how many? No one comes to the Father except through me. Acts 4, 12 puts it very plainly. There is, this verse says, no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Right? There is Salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. And there are many other passages. I want to just give you quickly five reasons why Jesus is the only way. He is the only way because he alone had full deity, right? Full deity. He only he had that perfect righteousness of God. He's the only way because, secondly, his full humanity. Only he, because of his full humanity, only he could take our place. Third, he's the only way because of his sinless life. He alone lived that sinless, holy life that is required to meet the standard. Right? He taught, Jesus said, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And only he met that standard. Fourth, only Christ fulfilled the law and prophecy, right? Only he fulfilled all of the law of God, all of the requirement of the law and all of the prophecy of God's revelation in the Old Testament. And fifth, only he died a substitutionary death and only he rose from the dead to break the power of sin. So there is salvation in no one else. Just read this verse one more time, Acts 4.12. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. So those are four kind of key tenets of the doctrine of salvation. And what I want to do with our remaining time, and this is why we uh, urged you to move a little closer. Now, it's going to get a little closer than that because I kind of broke it down into chunks. But I put this slide up here because there's this kind of eight and a half by 11 handout that, that I give when I'm teaching uh, this topic. And so it kind of has a front and a, and a back side. So I wanted you to kind of see what it looks like. And what it does is it takes the 25 key terms or ideas about salvation, and then it helps you to kind of see how they, how they are applied, right? So for example, you see in that, that column here that these these terms here explain why we receive salvation. Then these terms here explain how we receive salvation. These explain what we receive in salvation. Right? And then you have the other column here. Th- these, column, these terms here are things that were provided before we ever believe. These are applied when we believe, and then these are supplied after we believe. So this column kind of helps to mark out what happens before we believe, when we believe, and then after we believe. And this column gives us kind of the why, the how, and the what. So I just want to kind of go through some of these briefly just to kind of, again, whet your appetite for them. Let's look at why we receive salvation, right? Things that were provided before we believe. And we'll get it a little closer here, right? Why we receive salvation, things that are provided before we believe. And the first subject that hopefully you can see there is the action of God the Father, His gracious election, right? Scripture teaches about His sovereign love, His foreknowledge, and predestination. So let's just go to maybe one text for each of those. Look at 
at the example of his sovereign love. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 10 says very simply, not that we loved God, but that he first loved us, right? And this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us, and he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Right? And then we have Ephesians 1, 4 through 5, which we've been studying in the mornings, in which it says that in love he predestined us to adoption as sons. So we have the sovereign love of the Father, which was provided to us before we ever believed. He loved us before we loved him, before we even knew him, and this is why we receive salvation. Then you have foreknowledge. So, for example, look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. The Scripture very clearly talks about God's foreknowledge. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. He says, Peter says, he's writing to those in different places. He lists the places, and he says that they are chosen. And then in verse 2, he says, they're chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. Right? So we have God's foreknowledge. Then we have predestination. Look at Romans 8, verse 29, which is also going to mention foreknowledge as well. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. So you have God's sovereign love, you have his foreknowledge, you have his predestination, and then you have the Son graciously provides the salvation, right? The Father elects the salvation, and then the Son provides it. He provides it through substitution, as we talked about, right? 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. Then you have the term propitiation, right? Propitiation. He was the propitiation for our sins. And this is, this one and the next one, propitiation and expiation, have a reference to the Old Testament Day of Atonement. One lamb would be killed in place of the sinner, and then another, the priest would lay his hands on, the, on, the, on its head, and that one would be t- taken away into the wilderness and released, symbolically taking their sins far away. And in 1 John 4.10, Romans 3.25, Hebrews 2.17, we see verses dealing with propitiation. And then expiation, the taking away of sin, we see... In Leviticus chapter 16, Psalm 103, Colossians chapter 2, and many others. Then you have redemption, right? Redemption. Look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For us, redemption. Then we have reconciliation. Look at 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 20. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18 through 20. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Reconciliation. So, Christ the Son graciously provides substitution, propitiation, expiation, redemption, and reconciliation. And then we have the work of the Spirit. And again, all the three members of the Trinity are involved in all of these things. So it's not that, that the Spirit wasn't involved uh, in election. It wasn't that the Spirit wasn't involved in redemption or reconcil- reconciliation. But these are things that are said very specifically to be the work of the Spirit. Gracious initiation of salvation. We have conviction, right? John chapter 16, the Holy Spirit is sent into the world to convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. Then we have drawing, right? John 6, says that no one can come to the Father unless he is drawn. And the Father draws through the work of the Holy Spirit, as is explained in 
John chapter 15, verse 26, chapter 16, verse 13 through 15, and 1 Corinthians 2, verses 1 through 16. <coughs> then we have something called the effectual call. The effectual call. Now, the best way to explain the effectual call is to liken it to what happened when Lazarus was in the tomb, right? Remember, Lazarus is in the tomb, and Jesus stands at the tomb and says, Lazarus, come forth, right? It was, it was a call that did something, right? It was an effectual call. It was a powerful call. Look, for example, at John chapter 10, verse 27, to see this idea of the effectual call. John chapter 10, verse 27, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Right? That's the effectual call. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 39. Acts chapter 2, verse 39. This is part of a sermon. It says, For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. As many as the Lord our God will call to himself. Then flip over to Acts chapter 16, verse 14. We're going to see a specific example of this. Acts chapter 16, verse 14. A woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. There was the call of God on her life. And then look at 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 13 and 14. 2, Timothy, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. For this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. Right? It performs its work in you who believe. If you remember from the Old Testament, God says that when he sends forth his word, it never returns to him void. It always accomplishes the purpose for which he sent it. This is the effectual call. Now, moving on then to the this one gets even smaller. <laughs> Sorry about that. This one gets even smaller. As we look now at these aspects, these aspects are going to talk about how we receive salvation, right? These three, and what we receive in salvation, the new birth, the new life, and the future life. And then this column kind of helps us to, to break down what things are applied when we believe, right? And what things are supplied after we believe, right? So let's take a look at some of these, right? Number 12, if you can see it up there, is repentance, right? This is the gift of God, salvation by faith alone, and one of the terms used is repentance, right? Jesus came, according to Mark chapter 1, verse 14 through 15, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, right? Repent and believe the good news, and so we see at the beginning of Christ's ministry that he is preaching this idea of repentance, and we see it at the end of his ministry as well. Look at Luke chapter 24, verse 47. Luke chapter 24, verse 47. He said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem, and you are witnesses of these things. All right, so then we go into the age of the apostles in Acts chapter 17, verse 30. Paul is preaching in Athens, and he says, God has commanded all men everywhere to do what? To repent. All right, then the next term that we have is belief, right? Belief. Right? Also in Mark, that same passage, repent and believe the good news. Right? John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Then we have in the New Testament the term conversion. 
Look, for example, at Matthew chapter 18, verse 3, this word conversion. Matthew chapter 18, verse 3. Jesus says, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. You know, it's interesting. I've heard of some missionaries who they'll go to a, a country and, you know, it's one of these countries where, you know, they have these anti-proselytizing laws, right, where it's illegal to convert from one faith to another. And I've heard of missionaries who, who will go and tell the people, we're not trying to convert anyone. Right? We, we're just trying to teach you to become Jesus followers. We're not trying to convert anyone from Islam to Christianity. We're not trying to convert anyone from Buddhism to Christianity. We're not trying to convert anyone from Hinduism to Christianity. We're just trying to make you Hindu followers of Jesus or Muslim followers of Jesus. And they specifically say, I, I've heard it said in my presence, we are not trying to convert anyone. And I've seen it in writing as well. Well, Jesus was trying to convert. Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Conversion. That's also spoken about in, in John 12, 40 and Acts 15, 3. These, by the way, are how we receive salvation, right? Repent and believe the gospel. Be converted. Become humble like a child. Now look at the new birth, right? We have union with Christ, taught in Romans chapter 6, verse 5, right? If we are united with him in his death, we will also be united with him in the likeness of his resurrection. Then you have regeneration, Titus chapter 3, verse 5. Let's read that one, Titus chapter 3, verse 5. He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Right? We're saved by the washing of regeneration. Then you have the term justification. Right? Justification. We've already been talking about this one. This is the term which means to be made right with God, to be declared not guilty, to be declared righteous. This is taught in Romans 3, 24 through 28, and Romans 4, chapter 4, verse 5, and chapter 8, verse 30, and also in Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. Then also we have, as part of the new birth, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, right? John chapter 14, verse 17, Jesus says, The Holy Spirit has been with you, and he will be in you. We see in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, a very clear statement that the Holy Spirit dwells in you. Then we have the term adoption. Right? If you remember from our study in the mornings in Ephesians chapter 1, that we are adopted as sons. John chapter 1, verse 12, Jesus said that to those who believe, he gave the right to be children of God. And then you have a wonderful passage in Galatians chapter 4, verses 5 through 7. It says, When the fullness of time came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. We are adopted as sons. And then we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Remember in our morning studies, Ephesians 1, 13 through 14, that we are sealed for the day of redemption by the Holy Spirit who is given as a pledge of our inheritance. And all of those things are things that, that we receive when we believe. When we believe, we are united with Christ. We are regenerated. We are justified. We are indwelled by the Holy Spirit. We are adopted as sons, and we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. And then we have the things which are supplied after we believe, right? After we believe. This is the new life, right? You're born again to a new life. And after you believe, God's not done with you yet. The Scripture talks about sanctification. 
in 2 Peter 1, verses 5 through 8, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14, and many other passages. It talks about preservation, how God, throughout all the temptations and trials and hardships of life, protects you by his power, right? The one who began a good work in you when he saved you, right? When he saved you, when, he, when you believed and you received all of those things, the one who began this good work in you is faithful to complete it. You are preserved by the power of God, Peter says, for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So you have the new birth, which if, if you're a believer, is past tense for you. We were saved. Then you have the new life. We are being saved, right? We're being sanctified and preserved. And then you have the future life. We will be saved. And the verb salvation is used, interestingly, in the Scripture, in past tense, in present tense, and in future tense, because it's describing these different aspects, what we were given when we believe and what is supplied after we believe. The future life is we will be saved as God promised. He will complete the work that he started in us, right? This is the doctrine of glorification, right? First John 3, 2, when we see him, we will be like him, for we, we, will, for we will see him as he is, right? Romans 8, 17 through the end of the chapter, talking about the hope that we have that will be realized in Christ. We will be glorified. And then the scripture teaches that even our physical bodies, we will be physically raised. The resurrection of the physical body is taught very clearly. Look at Romans, for example, Romans chapter 8, verse 11. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, right? So here he is, he's referring back to this aspect, right? Here's this indwelling, right? Which happened the moment that you believed. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. And then the last and glorious truth is the new heavens and the new earth. Revelation 21, and we'll end there, so turn there with me. Revelation chapter 21. Here is the final chapter in the story of our salvation. Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he is going to do something amazing. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death, there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Right, for these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without costs. This is the great and glorious end of our story, if we know the Lord. So, again, as we kind of look at these things, and I'll go back to the overview, right? We look at, these are, frankly, there's many more terms in Scripture used to describe our salvation, but these are kind of 25 of the key ones. And what I wanted you to do is just to, to, to marvel at all that God has done for us, right? The Father's gracious choice, the Son's gracious provision, the Spirit's gracious initiation, right? And then the gift of God, which is salvation by faith, the new birth, the new life, and the future life. All of these things are given to us by grace. And for these things, we worship the one who saved us. And I want to close by giving him that praise. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, tonight we have merely skipped along the surface of truths which 
will leave us in awe forever. Lord, each one of these 25 great truths, Lord, could be a whole message in and of themselves, Lord, and in fact, they could be the song and the praise of our hearts for a lifetime. Lord, we are thankful that we will have all of eternity, Lord, to give you the glory and the praise and the worship for all that you've done for us in the past and the present and in the future. Lord, we thank you for the new birth. Lord, we thank you for the sanctifying work of the Spirit, and we thank you for the promise that we will be glorified together with Christ, that you will come back and you will raise us and raise our physical bodies, Lord, and give us glorified bodies like your glorified body after your resurrection, Lord, and we will enjoy your presence forever and ever in the new heavens and new earth. Lord, these truths are so wonderful for us that our minds struggle to comprehend them. Lord, we often get bogged down in some of the details, but Lord, help us to fully grasp the wonder and the grandeur of all that you've done for us. As the pages of Scripture open to us, your majesty, your grace, your love, your mercy, Lord, may our hearts respond to you with love, with obedience, Lord, with worship, Lord, with hearts that rejoice in you and give you the glory. And for this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Go in peace.